All right, Alan, firstly, uh, first and foremost, welcome to Go Open, uh, a show which is quite revolutionary in terms of open source software in the world. Well, thank you for inviting me. Well, an absolute pleasure. Uh, first of all, Alan, let's go into your history a bit. Uh, you were heavily involved in the development of the Linux kernel since its early days. Exactly what was your involvement in that? Um, initially, I was involved with the games industry, and I had a multiplayer game I was writing. I needed something more stable than Windows to run it on. I was used to Unix in university, and so I, I sort of accidentally ended up trying to run it on Linux very early on. Linux wasn't good enough, so I started fixing bugs, improving Linux, making it do the things I wanted. And over time, I ended up in charge of the networking layer, then making Linux run on multiprocessor machines. And eventually I got hired by Red Hat, and I now work full-time professionally on the Linux operating system. What exactly is Red Hat in terms of Linux? We are um, several things. Firstly, as an organization, we're able to contribute to open source. We're able to develop software. For our customers, we also, in a sense, filter and package. Because if you look on the internet, there are millions and millions of pieces of software of variable quality. They don't always work together. So a lot of our job is putting these pieces together in a package people can use. Then on top of that, in the, the business world, we support businesses, we do training, and all the sort of things that you need to build a business environment around this kind of software. There's more to it, if you like, than just a CD with packages on. What exactly is more to it? People need to be able to use it. They need to be able to trust it. They need to know it's reliable. Businesses tend to want somebody that can come back to and say, we've got this problem, or we're trying to do the following, what is the best way of doing it? So providing knowledge and information to organizations. The antagonists to, uh, to open source will say that open source might be a bit unre more unreliable compared to uh, proprietary software. On the whole, open source software, mature open source software at least, is very reliable. You can certainly look at things that people are developing new, and they won't be reliable, like, like any new software. Um, because everybody gets the source code, when there are problems, we get large numbers of people who are able to work on them. We also get a lot of users who are reading the code. So people reading the code for, to learn from it, for example, will sometimes find bugs or have questions. And with that sort of peer review, like, like in professional engineering and unlike a lot of software development, you can't hide things under the carpet. There is no way of hiding out. This isn't a very good piece of software because it's all out there. The source code is there for everybody to see and say, this isn't the right way to do it. In terms of production, we see very, very high reliability. Um, up times up to sort of an, a year or more are not uncommon on Linux servers. A lot of people who would have heard of Linux at this moment would probably be techies working in either an ISP, uh, in server farms, that kind of thing. But to an average man, what can Linux do for them? It can give them a stable operating system. It can give them an environment they are in control of. So, for example, um, large companies have looked, for example, in South Africa, at things like Zulu and said, oh, there's not enough money in this to justify translation. With open source software like OpenOffice, people have actually been able to go out there and say, we don't care if a large American company thinks I need Zulu on my desktop. I can have Zulu on my desktop. And so things have been translated. So you've got control over your software, which is something which is not an immediately obvious advantage to many users, but turns out to be really important. A lot of the desktop things are really only just maturing. So for many desktop users, Linux at the moment might not be the, the perfect replacement for their Windows box. It's starting in the more technical, with more technical users, and it's gradually filtering out as we, we hone the desktop, we make it more usable, we get more applications that fit small home user needs, more games, these kind of things. What do you think of people attempting to put GNU Linux on, on everything possible from Xbox to PlayStation to cell phones, they, whatever they could possibly try and find, they put on. It's a great development platform for building software on a very large number of devices. Um, it's not just sort of hackers doing this. There are businesses selling large numbers of things like wireless routers, uh, little gateway devices, handheld PDAs like the Zorus, all of which are built, built around the Linux software. 
And it really demonstrates how flexible Linux is, that the same code is being used on an IBM mainframe and on a handheld PC, and probably very soon on mobile phones. And in what way would uh, one see Linux on mobile, mobile phones, for instance? There are companies doing development with Linux, m mixture of Linux and Java on mobile phones as a potential platform for next generation mobile telephones. Because the mobile phone is really changing, at least in Western Europe and the USA, from being a, a, a telephone with organizing functions into a, a personal pocket computing device. And people are actually starting, in some cases, even to move away from desktop computing. If they don't have this sort of document preparation need, for example, in some sales roles, they're tending to treat their, hat, their PDA come mobile phone as their primary computing device. And as you do this, you want more and more functionality in your phone, which makes it much more of a computer. It needs an operating system. Um, even from a technical perspective, today's m modern mobile phones have got more memory and more computing power than a PC did 10 years ago. When it comes to the technology side, referring to a PlayStation or a cell phone, for instance, would you find that it could perhaps drop the price of that kind of equipment? I think it's got enormous potential for dropping the prices of equipment. Um, the prices on PCs today are already partly constrained by the operating system product. Um, in addition to that, there are constraints because of the hardware, the, the desire to be uh, Intel compatible, for example. There have been several projects like Semputer in India trying to build cheaper computers around things like Linux and cheaper processors. The big problem you still have is volume. The thing that makes everything in this world at the moment cheap is volume. And there isn't a volume hardware platform which can really drive the prices down yet. Once we have that, Linux will become much more important because it should very rapidly reach the point where the Windows operating system price exceeds the hardware price of your computer. What's your opinion on the drive of open source into developing markets? I think it's, it's tremendously important. It doesn't just give people the use of computers. Because you've got the source code, it gives people in all of these countries the ability to change the software. In other words, not only are you getting a, a prepackaged desktop environment which, for all the computers, which can be recycled and reused and has no cost, you are also being given a piece of software which you can use to build your own software on. Um, you can use it in, in university environments as a teaching environment. So it's not just the software, it's the knowledge that goes with it you get with open source. Now, what about the mindset? A lot of people somehow confuse sometimes the term free software and open source. Personally, I, I, I think they are two arguments to the same end. The free software people tend to focus on ideas around community ownership, this sort of thing. The open source people tend to focus on business efficiency and whether this way of writing software is a better fundamental economic system for writing software, whether it's more efficient. Um, it, as far as I can see, both are true. And they're both arguments for the same way of writing software. It is more efficient. It is a better way of building community. Because instead of all competing around the software, you're competing around the services and the add-ons, but you're cooperating at the things which are really, really hard to do. And when you have software and you take it outside of, for example, a business, but into the third world, you've got both the business argument of, oh, I can take on, for example, the Zulu market locally. You also have the community argument saying it would be a good thing if large numbers of South Africans could use computers in their first language. And so they're, they're, they're two sides of the the same fundamental question, I think. The other thing which has happened in the European Union, um, there are really three phrases being used, free software, open source, and also Libra software, using the French sort of Latin word to make it clearer that it's free as in freedom, not free as in price. You know, so it's freedom in sense of rights. And the European Union ended up with free Libra and open source software as the phrase it uses for documents and for research work in order to avoid getting into any arguments about subtle distinctions that really don't matter to most users. How would you describe the other side of the market, the proprietary market? They obviously are on a very differing opinion with regards to the efficiency and development of, of new software specific for particular markets. How do you see their point of view? Well, I don't know if the dispute is necessary about efficiency. There are a lot of